What a wonderful day. Amen. I'm so glad to see everybody. I wanted to talk today about loving the brethren. What better thing could we do? This lesson we're going to study mostly from the book of John. You know, John's been sometimes referred to as the apostle of love because he speaks on the subject so often. We're going to take a close look today at brotherly love. Loving, loving the brethren is a sign of our salvation and of the promise that we have for eternal life. Love for each other reflects God's love for man and our love for God. Love is sometimes a, a sacrifice that must be made when necessary. Sometimes we have to make ourselves love our brother. Love is a work that must be done. We must share the love. Not like the hippies did, but like God would have us share our love. Okay. Love provides an assurance of our salvation and of our working knowledge of God's truth comes through love. It's my hope that if we can understand more about brotherly love as, as what is taught in 1 John 3, 14 through 19, a lot of today's sermon will be based on that section, that we will increase in brotherly love as individuals and as a congregation. We'll read through that right quick. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. We need to be ready to do that. But whoso hath the world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion for him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? If you ignore the needs of your brethren, you're not showing the love of God. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So it's not just enough to love from afar. We need to be involved with each other and love each other and help along the way. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Now John's been referred to, as I said, as the apostle of love. Perhaps it's because he discusses the subject more than any other gospels or epistles. But I was kind of out of town yesterday, and that's the day I normally would have gone through. And I, with this subject, done a word count and found out how many times John said the word love, just because... It's fun stuff to know, you know. So the apostles certainly had problems loving, loving each other, didn't they? And don't we today sometimes have trouble loving each other? There were times when they contended with one another, remember? On one occasion, two disciples wanted to sit on the right and left hand of Jesus. And the other disciples were upset because of the request. They were having trouble loving each other. If, if, if they were not having trouble, they would be saying, oh, I hope he gets to sit there. I hope he gets to sit there. But instead they were saying, I hope I get to sit there. I hope I get to sit there. Jesus had to instruct the disciples on how things were to be in the kingdom. One of those disciples was John. Okay? He seems to have learned the lesson well that Jesus taught regarding love of one's brethren because he talks about it more than anybody else. So he must have taken Jesus' words to heart. Well, that's the first time that's happened. 
So loving the brethren is a sign of our salvation. Okay? And of the, our promise of eternal life. So if you didn't get a chance to read along with us, remember, write those verses down and go back over them. John 3, 14 and 15 says, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Remember? Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. Who, who's, who's he murdering when he hates his brother? He's murdering himself. When we keep Jesus' commandments, we can know that we abide in him and he is in us because if we love him, we'll do as he asks, right? So if he, if he abides in us, then we're, we love him and we're going to do what he asks us to do. He tells us in 1 John 3, 23 and 24, and this is his commandment, that we should believe in the, in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. As he, if he gave, as he gave us, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, where did I get lost? As he gave us commandment, and he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know, we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. Okay? <sighs> Too many commandments in those verses. When we love one another, we know that God abides in us. In 1 John 4, 12, it says, No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us. Okay? And his love is perfected in us. When God abides in us, he can know that we have salvation and eternal life. Okay? One of the reflections of the love of God and our love for God is loving the brethren. Okay? We find guidance for brotherly love in 1 John 3.16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Okay? God's example of love motivates us to love one another. Let's take a look at what John had to say in 1 John 4, 7 through 11. Beloved, let, let us love one another okay? for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. You can't know God if you don't love. Because if you know God, you love. Okay? He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And this was, and verse 9 says, in this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might love through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. Why? We may never know. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Verse 10, herein is love, that not that we love God, but that he loved us. I like that propitiation. <laughs> I use that verse as often as I can, just so I can say propitiation. And you guys will know that I do not stumble over every word that I say, just about every other word. If we can't show our love for our brother, we're not showing our love for God either. It's just that simple. 1 John 4, 20 and 21 says, If a man say, I love God, and he hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. We should never try to undercut our brethren with Biting words or actions while professing that we have great love for God. 
because it just don't work that way. Jesus displayed his love for his fellow man as well and, and expects us to follow his example. Look to Jesus if you need to know how to love somebody, how to treat somebody. How did Jesus do it? Remember all the little, what would Jesus do? Bracelets they used to have all the time. We need to think about that. What would Jesus do? In John 15, 12 through 13, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. So not only are we not to attack our brothers, we are to defend our brothers and put our lives in place of theirs, if that's how it has to be. God's example through Jesus motivates us to love one another. Paul also supports the need for loving our brothers in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9. But as touching brotherly love, ye, <clears throat> ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Paul reminds the Thessalonians of that, love one another. So love is a sacrifice, and sometimes... That sacrifice must be made when necessary. 1 John 3, 17, I'll take you back there. But whoso hath the world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion for him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? So my, my wonderful wife and I had six kids between us. And we loved them all intensely and we still do but no matter what we did there was always one of them that thought they were not getting what was due them. or they were sure everyone was picking on them because they did not get their way we occasionally find this in the church too don't we our love must serve our brothers and sisters and not serve our earthly desires for goods and attention as we see in Galatians 5.13, it says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Now, keep in mind, occasion to the flesh does not mean illicit affairs and things. It means earthly things. The flesh is what can happen to you while you're in this form, while we are waiting to go to God. Those things while we are still in the flesh of the body. Our service must come in the form of blessing one another, not attacking each other. 1 Peter 3, 8 through 9. See, I wanted to get as many apostles as I could in here. <laughs> Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one for another. Love as brethren. Be pit pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but uh, yeah, see, I can get propitiation. Contrarywise, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. Okay, we're called to love. Peter says it, Paul says it, John says it, and John says it, and John says it. That means we won't cause a stumbling block for our brothers. 1 John 2, 10 through 11 says, He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walks in darkness, and knoweth not whether he goeth, because that darkness has blinded his eyes. If we're supposed to lay down our lives for our brothers, then certainly we can sac sacrifice lesser things for them as well. It should be easier to give up the lesser things for our brothers if we're willing to die for them. Love is a work that must be done. And remember John 3.18, it says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. 
Loving your brother isn't an optional matter. It is a requirement. John 15, 17 says, These things I command you, that ye love one another. We must love one another fervently, diligently, with effort. We must take the effort to love one another. And it's like I said, you can't just, oh yeah, I love all those people. You need to be active in the lives of the fellowship, showing your love for one another. Look for opportunity to show your love to your brother. 1 Peter 1.22 says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. This was exemplified for us in a letter Paul wrote to Philemon. In Philemon 1.7 he says, for we have great joy and consolation in thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. You make me happy, brother. It is through love that we are given an assurance of our salvation. 1 John 3.19 To love one another is to follow God as his children. Look, take a quick look at Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. It says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one with another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Okay. So, the only malice we should have in our lives is against evil speaking and anger and clamor in our brothers. We shouldn't have malice towards our brothers. We should have malice towards evil speaking, anger, clamor, wrath, all bitterness. You've heard me many times say it's hard to be sad when we count our blessings. And it is. <coughs> If you're holding grudges and can't help but point out a brother's faults, then maybe it's time you look at how they bless the church. Okay. If somebody stepped in front of me on the way to the water fountain and I get mad at them about that, I need to tell myself, well, he was probably thirsty from praying. You know, I need to look at what that person does for the church. I need to look at him as a brother and how we share this love. And guess what? I won't have time to be mad at him anymore. Because I can find a lot more that every person out here does for this church, for this fellowship, for each other, than anything they've ever done that might have slighted me or wronged me or, you know, I didn't want to ride that lawnmower when we mowed the lawn. I wanted to ride the other lawnmower. Well, so, isn't it great that he's here mowing lawn? There's always much more good that we can find in these, especially in the brotherhood. So focus on that, just like counting your blessings, you know? You've heard, <clears throat> so if we're, you know, as we count those good things, we'll begin to put those other things behind us and they'll be lost. If we're mad at the leadership, just count all the good that they've done and continue to do for this church. You know, elders kind of sometimes get to be targets because they're elders and they know that when they take the job that they, they'll be the targets. You know, It's kind of the old buck stops here kind of thing, right? But the thing is, if I'm upset because an elder made a decision that I didn't quite like, somebody in the leadership made a decision that I didn't like, well, once again, Look at all the decisions they've made that I do like. 
look at the wonderful place we're going and how well the money's managed and, and all of that stuff. Then we can put all those grudges behind us because we know they don't amount to a hill of beans compared to what these guys are going through every day to provide a good home for God. We should speak in love, not anger, always. Anger, anger, <coughs> anger. These long words, you know. Anger is the devil's tool. Love is a work of God, always. If the devil can get you angry, he can make you throw your soul away. It's just that easy. He will lead you astray, following that anger, almost like you were addicted to a drug. And before you know it, all you ever are is angry. In, in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, it tells, tells us, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ hath loved you and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. Be ye followers of God as dear children. You remember the days when your children just thought you could do no wrong? It was, believe me, sometime before 16 years old. But when, when they're little, they look up at you and I want to be like daddy. I want to be like mom. They see you do something and they try to copy it. Remember those days? That's how we're supposed to worship God. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be that special loving heart. We should be as children. We should love as children before they turn 16. When we love as God loved us, we can hold in regard our salvation. 1 John 4, 16 and 17 says, we have, <clears throat> we have known and believed the love God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. We are God's representative, and we should be representing God with the love that he gave to us so that other people want that love also. You know, the thing that drives people to join gangs is a, is a feeling of family that they get by belonging to something, okay? The, the, the same thing causes people to join clubs. The same thing makes people want to play football, makes people want to be in the band, whatever, they want that feeling of belonging to something. Well, we want them to want to belong to us, all right? We want them to belong to God so that they may know the love that we know, and we want to give them that feeling of family that carries on day after day. Loving the brethren is a sign of our salvation and of the promise of eternal life. Loving the brethren is a reflection of the love of God and our love for God. Loving the brethren is a sacrifice that must be made. Loving the brethren is a work that must be done. Loving the brethren is an assurance of our salvation and of a working knowledge of God's truth. We've all had the opportunity to make love the pinnacle of our lives. We've, we've heard the word of God, haven't we? And he's telling us to love. We believe that Christ is the son of God or we've already or we're ready to confess that, that fact before men. We're all ready to confess God because we've done it before. We're ready to repent of our sins, and we do it every day as Christians. Okay, If you're not a Christian and you're ready to repent of your sins, knowing that God's waiting to forgive them, 
Okay? We do it because we're still sinners. If, if you're not a Christian, you can do it so you can become a Christian. To get those sins off your chest. Get them thrown behind you. Most of us in this room have already been baptized for the remission of our sins. But if you've been waiting, now is the time. If you wait too long, it may be just that. Too late. So most of us have determined to live a life in a loving brotherhood. That's why we're here each morning. But if you're one of those that have not yet made that step to become part of that brotherhood, know that everyone in this room loves you and they're rooting for you and they're praying for you and just like God, they're waiting for you. God's waiting. He's waiting for you to know the love that he has to share with you every day of your life by all the people here. So if you're ready to make that step or if you just need prayers, then please come as we stand and sing.